when we sin, <clears throat> um, we definitely need to feel the guilt of that when we come to the realization of our sin. Uh, when we finally admit to our sin and acknowledge our sin, we should feel ashamed. We should feel the guilt and the pain and the, the godly sorrow. We should feel the, the judgments and wrath of God, and we should see how serious it is that we have sinned. Um, we definitely do not need to sugar sugarcoat sin. Um, we don't need to make sin out to be no big deal. Um, sin is very real. It is very serious. It is very devastating. God looks at sin um, very seriously. So when we do sin, um, we do need to hurt and be sad and um, fear and, and feel that guilt and shame of what we have done. But then, here's the wonderful thing about the God we serve. The God who created us. He is the God who loves us. And the wonderful thing about God and what is amazing, one of the awesome and amazing things about God is His wonderful love and mercy and grace and that is not a, a New Testament thing. That's not just um, made available in Jesus. At least when we're talking about the love and mercy of God. This is something that, that God has show, shown to his people throughout the history of mankind. His love, his mercy, his grace that man has never deserved. And David, King David, David, a man after God's own heart, knew well what it is to receive mercy from God. Because what we know about David, if you go back in the Old Testament and we read about his life and we read a lot of the good things David did and we read that he was chosen by God to be king because he was a man after God's own heart. And, um, and certainly David showed a lot of faith and devotion to God. But as, as great as David did... Um, even being a man after God's own heart, David was still human. Um, David still failed at times. David was not a perfect man. He was not a sinless man. And we can read about that through his history. But there was a psalm that he gives us that, and really many of the psalms that he writes about his own guilt and sin. I mean, as often as David in the psalms is writing about the evils and wickedness of others, and rightfully so, um, there are times in the psalms where he reflects on his own evil and wickedness at times and his need for God's mercy and patience and love and forgiveness. So, when we, the psalm we're going to read today is a psalm that, and what I was trying to say earlier to get started today, is that while, yes, we should certainly feel, <coughs> excuse me, the pain and the guilt and the shame of our sin. Well, when we are willing to come to God, acknowledge our sins, repent of our sins, that is, yes, feel sorry for them, admit we were wrong, confess our sins to God, acknowledge them. We ask God to forgive us. God's promise is that he will forgive us. He is faithful and just to forgive us. And so after we have felt the pain and shame of sin, we then need, when we come to God for forgiveness, we then can feel and need to feel the joy of forgiveness, the joy, the freedom, the comfort, of God's mercy and love. Let's look at the psalm today. It's Psalm 32. Psalm 32, a psalm of David. And we're going to talk about the joy of forgiveness. As he says, really here in verse 1, which is something later that Paul quotes in the book of Romans, I believe, if I'm remembering that correctly, um, that he quotes this in talking about the mercy and love of God. And the mercy God has even shown us that you know, David says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. So David's talking about blessings and joy and, 
and true happiness and hope when he says that the, these blessings or blessed is the one whose sin is forgiven and whose sin is covered up by God. That is to say, verse 2, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute or count or charge an account of sin or iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. David says how, how great it is when God does not hold our sins against us, when we are forgiven, when our sins are covered by the mercy of God. David says, verse 3, notice this, when I kept silent, silent about what? What did David keep silent about? I believe he's talking about keeping silent about his sins. He says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. So it seems David has this internal groaning and struggle and pain and sorrow because he knows he's guilty, but he's not done anything about it. He's, he's keeping it in. He's remaining silent. He's, he's not wanting anybody to know, although God already knows, but he's not yet confessed it. He's not yet done anything about his sins. And so he says it was hurting it was hard for David to keep silent about what he knew he did wrong. But then verse 5, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you. He acknowledged his sins to God. And my iniquity I have not hidden. Instead of hiding his iniquity, he confessed it. He acknowledged it. He made it known. He said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. David says, I can't keep silent about my sin. I know I've done wrong. I know it's not okay. I know I can't just shrug it off or say no big deal. So David says, I will confess my sins to the Lord. And then what? What does David say happened after he confessed his sins to the Lord? He says, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David was struggling. He was not confessing his sins and it was destroying him inside. But he finally says, I've got to confess my sins to the Lord. And he does. And then he knows that his sins are forgiven. What a relief. I think that's really what David is getting at and why it is such a blessing. I mean, what a blessing it is to have the forgiveness of God, to know his mercy and grace and love. And so because God, he says, because God forgave him of his sins, he says in verse 6, For this cause, everyone who is godly will pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I mean, David knows that the godly can pray and trust and hope in the Lord and the Lord will be with them. David knows, though, that the Lord is not going to help the ungodly, that the Lord is not going to protect those in sin. But David has confessed his sins. He has forgiven. David's saying, we know we can trust in the Lord and that God is our rock, our hiding, our hiding place. He will save us. He will bless us. If we confess our sins. And then verses 8 and 9 seem to be a word from the Lord to David. That I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle. Else they would not come near you. The Lord says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you. I will lead you. But we got to let him. And the Lord says, don't be like a horse or a donkey that has no understanding. And they've got to be forced to do things with the reins. They've got to have a bit in their mouth, a bridle on. You've got to pull them here, pull them there. Don't be stubborn. 
trust in the Lord, listen to him and obey. So then David wraps this up by saying in verse 10, many sorrows will be to the wicked. Sin and wickedness, while it might have momentary pleasure, in the end, wickedness brings sorrow and destruction, shame, punishment, guilt, and wrath. But the one who trusts in the Lord, mercy will surround him. The one who trusts in the Lord, mercy will surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. David is saying to us that if we will live the way God calls us to live, to be righteous and holy as God is holy, then we know God hears us. We know God is with us. We know we have his blessings, his love, his mercy, his grace. Mercy will surround us. Be glad and rejoice. And the only, re the only reason that's possible is because of God's mercy and grace and love. The reason we rejoice like David is blessed is the man whose sins are not charged against him. The reason we as Christians can rejoice and, and be glad and have the hope of eternal life in heaven is not because we've somehow done something great and wonderful ourselves. It's what God has done for us. God has not given me what I deserve. And that should make me ecstatic, rejoicing, joyful, happy, singing praises to God, telling others about the wonderful grace and mercy of God. So David here really shows us the two things. One, the guilt and suffering and shame of sin. But then two, the relief and blessing and joy of when we finally come to God, we confess our sins to him and he forgives us. He restores to us the joy of salvation. And while, yes, we need to feel guilt and shame over our sins, we don't need to stay there if God says he forgives us. If we come to God, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, and we need to believe that. And we need to feel that joy and that hope and that relief. That God casts our sins into the depths of the sea. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy towards us. As far as the east is from the west, so he has removed our sins from us. We got to believe that. And feel the joy and hope that our sins are forgiven. And thanks be to God. Praise God for his wonderful love and mercy. If you don't have that joy because of some sin, you haven't confessed some sin, you are hiding something you're being silent about, be silent no more. Go to God for forgiveness, for comfort, and the joy of salvation. Praise God. God bless.